After Francis Bacon proposed his new method of science, natural philosophy blossomed into undreamed of heights. His scientific method, which was based on carefully observing and measuring the creation, led to amazing advances. Bacon pointed out that his new method was necessary because nature carries the stamp of the creator, whereas the old method relied on man's reason, which carried the stamp of his own folly. We will have it that all things are as we think they should be. But the proud promoters of the Enlightenment, who magnified and glorified man's reason, claimed that the enormous advances from this new science showed only a triumph of man's powers of reasoning. They soon claimed that the Creator was unnecessary. After all, with this new science, man was explaining everything without involving God. Not surprisingly, shortly after that, God became to them simply an unnecessary and worthless hypothesis. To deny the existence of God, they realised it was a philosophical necessity to believe in spontaneous generation leading to evolution. And to believe in that, they had to believe in a vast timescale to allow the slow, never-witnessed processes which were supposed to drive evolution to happen. So Charles Lyell applied his persuasive, argumentative prowess as a lawyer to clothe James Hutton's ideas of a very old earth in convincing terms based on a purely hypothetical idea which he called the principle of uniformitarianism. His friend, Charles Darwin, then used Lyell's long time scale to justify his story of evolution, which in turn was based on a totally incorrect understanding of genetics. Since both of these bastions of Enlightenment wisdom are regularly shown to be false, ever more detailed examination of the creation has become an embarrassment to the Enlightenment's devotees. In 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick discovered the structure of DNA. Shortly afterwards, Crick announced that the sequence of nucleotides in the double helix of DNA were coded instructions to direct the functioning of the cell. This is so obviously evidence for intelligent input that Crick found it necessary to write Biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but evolved. Presumably, he said this to save himself from the wrath of the establishment, which falls mercilessly on any suggestion of a designer. This coding of DNA was extremely embarrassing to evolutionary biologists. Bill Gates likened it to the operating program of a computer, but with code far more complex than any yet written by any team of programmers. Only the most committed evolutionists, innocent of any mathematics, people like Richard Dawkins, kept preaching that the utter impossibility of all this complex information was somehow within the reach of unguided evolution. And, of course, the threat of the establishment's retribution led many to value their careers more highly than honesty, and they simply kept silent. But we did see a few brave scientists daring to make honest comments, like Louis Bourneur. Evolutionism is a fairy tale for grown-ups, this theory has helped nothing in the progress of science. It is useless. Soren Lovetrop I believe that one day the Darwinian myth 
will be ranked the greatest deceit in the history of science. Malcolm Muggeridge I myself am convinced that the theory of evolution, especially the extent to which it's been applied, will be one of the great jokes in the history books of the future. Posterity will marvel that so very flimsy and dubious an hypothesis could be accepted with the incredible credulity that it has. And, of course, the outstanding scientist of the last century, Fred Hoyle, who suffered astounding persecution, his Nobel Prize being given to a minor collaborator. Expulsion from the world's foremost astronomy centre, which he had built up at Cambridge University, and still being belittled and disparaged on internet platforms today. Because he dared to say things like, the notion that not only the biopolymers, but the operating programme of a living cell could be arrived at by chance in a primordial soup here on the earth is evidently nonsense of a high order. Harvard professor Owen Gingerich said, Fred Hoyle and I differ on lots of questions, but on this we agree. A common sense and satisfying interpretation of our world suggests the designing hand of a super-intelligence. I suspect he dared to say that, because as an emeritus professor, he was near the end of his career anyway. Of course, the secular establishment has no option but to maintain evolution to deny a creator. As Wald and philosophers all the way back to ancient history, repeatedly pointed out, spontaneous generation leading to evolution is the only alternative to creation by a creator. And for evolution to be even vaguely possible, vast ages of time had to be manufactured by Charles Lyell, as we saw in episode 23. But sadly, for Enlightenment secularists, the Creator's creation has a habit of proclaiming the Creator's presence. It's just as Walter Remine wrote in The Biotic Message. It looks as if life was designed to refute any materialistic explanation for how it came about. And it looks as if it was also designed to refute Lyle's cunningly manufactured millions of years too. Microbiologists eventually realised that none of the DNA in our genome is junk, as they originally thought. It is all essential. Another unwelcome surprise was that about a hundred mutations are being fixed in the DNA every generation. Even more unwelcome, those mutations are never observed to give improvement. They're observed to cause damage, and impaired function is rapidly showing itself throughout all populations. It's specifically leading to infertility and digestive problems. Many features are required for reproduction. It takes only one to fail to lead to infertility. Many enzymes are needed for digestion. And when an enzyme suffers a mutation, it leads to inability to digest some kind of food. Many people are now unable to digest various common foods. Calculations have shown that even if one mutation gets fixed in every generation, the species will die out. A hundred mutations per generation put a very severe limit on how far life can be pushed back into history. Just a few thousand years, which for a secular humanist is uncomfortably reminiscent of the Bible's timescale and definitely to be strenuously opposed. But one kind of DNA 
presents an even bigger blow to the Enlightenment's cherished stories. Mitochondrial DNA is found in little molecular factories called mitochondria, which are found in every cell of the body. Their job is to convert energy carried by sugars into a high-powered energy carrier called adenosine triphosphate, which delivers energy to wherever the cell needs it. In reproduction, the mother's egg cell contains mitochondria, but from the father, only genetic material, nuclear DNA, enters the egg during fertilization. Mitochondria from the father play no role in the development of the fertilized egg. That means that all people, male and female, inherit their mitochondrial DNA from their mother only. Many researchers occupied themselves with studying mitochondrial DNA from all ethnic groups from all over the world. They found mutations which had accumulated over many years, and to their astonishment, they could all be traced back to one original woman. The finding was published, jokingly referring to that original woman as mitochondrial Eve. They applied what is known as the evolutionary clock to gain some idea of the time and locations revealed by the observations. This clock assumes the time when humans appeared in the evolutionary time scale. That time is divided by the number of observed mutations and concludes that is the number of years between each mutation. But when they examined a great deal of mitochondrial DNA, they observed mutations happening every third generation. Using that, instead of the evolutionary clock's guess, Eve lived about 6,000 years ago. Even more amazing, early in the story, Eve's progeny divide into three distinct lines, one corresponding with generally Asian lineage, one generally with African lineage, and one generally with European lineage. That seems to fit pretty well with the Bible's account that three of Eve's female descendants and their husbands were the only surviving breeding couples after the Great Flood. Noah's three sons and their wives eventually went their separate ways, Shem to Asia, Ham to Africa, and Japheth to Europe. But the plot thickens. Y chromosomes are passed on only by males. Females have no Y chromosomes to pass on to their offspring. Mothers pass on one X chromosome to each of their offspring. Fathers pass on an X chromosome to their daughters, but a Y chromosome to their sons. This allows a rather similar opportunity to trace male descent, and surprise, surprise, that tracked back to one original man. He was given the name Y chromosomal Adam, even though in this case the first traceable chromosome would actually have come from Noah. Well, of course, there had to be a concerted effort to deny that this could have anything to do with the Bible, especially from anything to do with Adam, Eve and Noah. So they tell us, just because mitochondrial DNA leads back to one woman, that doesn't mean that she was the first woman in the world. There could have been hordes of other women who had, of course, descended from chimpanzees. It's just that none of them passed on a surviving genetic record. Well, 
Of course, you're welcome to believe that, if you choose. And just because Y chromosomes lead back to one man, that doesn't mean that he was the first man. True. But Noah was the only man who supplied genetic material to everyone born after the flood. And, of course, his three daughters-in-law were all descended from Eve, not from any of those supposed hordes of women who might have descended from chimpanzees. A report from Stanford University School of Medicine tells us, Mitochondrial Eve and Y-chromosomal Adam, two individuals who passed down a portion of their genomes to the vast expanse of humanity, are known as our most recent common ancestors, or MRCAs. But many aspects of their existence, including when they lived, are shrouded in mystery. Well, it strikes me that things are only being shrouded in mystery because nobody wants to accept the obvious. Nuclear DNA mutations are pointing to just a few thousand years for the maximum lifetime of functioning DNA. Mitochondrial DNA is pointing to Eve living about 6,000 years ago. And as nature pointed out about 10 years ago, genetic Adam and Eve did not live too far apart in time. Well, yes. Noah, their genetic Adam, passed on his Y chromosomes to his three sons about 1,500 years after Eve was created. And that is only shrouded in mystery. For those who refuse to accept what Hoyle and Gingerich, two really outstanding scientists, concluded a few decades ago. Everything to do with DNA is pointing to the designing hand of a super-intelligence. And why should we believe what the secular authorities tell us instead? Well, the Guardian Higher Educational Network pointed to that very problem. Why can't we trust academic journals to tell the scientific truth? A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.